Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we are uh, back to the uh, Pierce Foundation webinar. And before we resume with our presentations, uh, Ms. Miri Ben Chaim uh, would like to say a few words, the head of the Division for External Studies. Miri, please. Thank you, Professor Soranga. Uh, I'm glad to open actually the last session of the two days webinar, the first uh, webinar of the Paris F Foundation. And I would like to thank <coughs> the Paris Foundation for everything they allowed us to do in this adventure. Uh, the Paris Foundation understood that uh, knowledge transfer and education is a force. And I think this is one of the main reasons they invested in this program, and we thank them very much for this. They believed in us, and they believed in our way, and this is the result of what has been done in these last few days. By their generosity, they enabled us to build up this whole program, <coughs> which is very new to the Hebrew University, and this is our first trial, hoping for many more to come. And by expanding activities, they allow us to open up to new uh, programs and to other challenges, and this is why we thank them greatly from the bottom of our heart. Good luck to you all. Please proceed. <laughs> so we proceed with our... Uh, afternoon session and the first presentation for uh, this session will be ma by Miriam Silva Ruiz. Miriam is uh, from Me Mexico. <coughs> she uh, graduated from the uh, Chapingo Autonomous University in, Me in Mexico and uh, she was later on a research associate at uh, UC Davis in California and an agronomist with uh, Evogen in Israel, and now a student uh, in our program. Miriam, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Miriam, and I'm from Mexico. The person that guided me through this research exercise is Dr. Rivka Elvanu, and our research intends to explain that salinity induces changes in tomato fruit texture. First of all, we have to realize that tomato is a cash crop for the state of Israel and all around the world, and therefore the trades that are involved in improving this crop are trades that are going to be related mainly to increasing the yield or to improve the pest resistance or to better drought resistant, or to just increase the shelf life. But these traits work really nice for the breeders and the growers since the early 90s because, yeah, indeed, every year the production was increasing and also the value per production was increasing. But in the last couple of years, we can see that the production more or less became stable. And the literature points out that this is mainly due to the fact that the traits that I mentioned it before they reach their final potential. Therefore, the growers, they cannot, if they cannot increase the yield anymore, so they have to look for trades that can increase the value of their production. Trades that are going to be mainly related to nutritional facts of the crop, to the flavor, to the appearance, overall trades related to tomato <coughs> fruit quality. So we have to understand that quality is any attribute that will determine the acceptability of the consumer if it rejects or if it doesn't like the product. Attributes of just like how does the fruit look in the shelf in the market or how does it feel in our hands when we touch it. But the most important of all, how does it feel in our mouth? How do we perceive the flavor? How do we perceive the formation and disintegration of the fruit in our mouth? And the attribute of uh, quality that measures these characteristics, it's texture. Texture itself has different components like softening or hardiness and it also has factors that affect texture. texture. The factors that uh, affect texture the most is, for example, quality of irrigation water. And it was observed but not measured by Leonardi in 2004 that if we grow tomatoes under salt stress, 
the peel will become thicker. And there are also issues regarding tomato fruit texture research. The main issue is that all the studies are focused in the improvement that salinity induces in quality. And there are really few studies that talk about how the salinity induces undesirable changes on quality. And when we're measuring texture, as I said before, we can measure it through objective tests. And the studies that measure texture through objective tests, they don't correlate it with sensory analysis, for example, organoleptic surveys. So the literature says that the best study will be the one that can put the three components together to do objective tests, to do sensory analysis, but even more, the one that does microstructural evaluation of the cells in the fruit. And therefore, the objective of all research is to characterize the overall indicators of fruit quality, but to follow the changes of morphology and structure of the cells in the fruit and see if, if it affects its fruit texture. And all of it under the uh, hypothesis that salinity induces undesirable changes in fruit and fruit skin, and it affects its quality. We divided our materials and methods in three phases. In the first phase, we didn't destroy our samples. In the second one, we did. And the third phase has to do with um, the microscopic analysis. The first phase intended to get results related to the whole fruit characteristics and to the peel. So what we did for this was that we set up the experiment in Ramat Negev, Israel, and then we had five different cherry tomato cultivars. We grew them on this is Siemens at 1.5 on the water, 4.0. We had a total of 100 experimental plots, and each plot was properly labeled. When the tomatoes had a markable stage, we harvest them all from the whole plot. The whole plot was harvested <coughs> in a black bin like this. And then from the bin, we took only five clusters. We collect them in this sample. And this sample was the one that we actually used for all of our measurements that I'm going to explain. The first measurement that we did was average fruit weight. We took 25 tomatoes. We divided the weight into 25. The second measurement that we did was we took four tomatoes and we punched it with this penetrometer. What it tells us, this machine here, is the, the force required to penetrate the tomato peeled. It brings us the lecture back in Newtons. The second uh, thing that we, the third thing that we did is that we generated our own scale. We generated two scales because even at a remarkable stage, there was a cultivar that had green strikes, so we had it to separate the red cultivars from the striped cultivar. A three meant a, a nice ripe fruit, and a one a less ripe fruit. We took five tomatoes from our sample, and we graded them <coughs> individually. Then we wanted to see how, how much does the peeled weight. So what we did is we took this puncher. It had a fixed area of one centimeter square. We punched five tomatoes. We put the tomato to boil, the peel to boil for around 30 seconds at 98 degrees. And this was to get rid of any extra pedicarp that we could be having in, the, in our peel. And then we dried it at 60 degrees Celsius for two days. And we took the dry peel weight. So we had results that were like related to weight and to color and to force required for peel rupture and dry peel weight. The results were as follows for this first phase. All the statistics were done under the consideration that it was a factorial design with two salinity levels, five cultivars, and there were three effects, the cultivar effect, the salinity effect, and the interaction effect. There were no significant differences in the interaction effect. Therefore, the first part of the graph is indicating the April harvest. The second part of the graph indicates May harvest. And the grouping that you see here with the letters, it's 2K, but it's grouping the different cultivars that are differentiated by different color. In the line part here, it's the salinity effect in each cultivar. So we can say that in terms of the weight, all for all the cultivars, their weight, when they were grown under salinity, it was reduced. And the cultivar that was the most susceptible as compared to its control 1.5 was cultivar 1335. And the cultivar that was the less susceptible was cultivar DCR522. But this doesn't mean that were the cultivars that had the higher or less weight. The higher weight was in cultivar 2204 as compared to all the other cultivars. And cultivar DCR522 had the less weight. In the color, we had some noise here because of the striped cultivar. 
And I, I believe this is the reason why we had statistical differences for the salinity, but more, nevertheless, the cultivar that was the more susceptible in terms of ripeness under salinity was cultivar 2206, and the cultivar that was less susceptible was cultivar 2204. In the penetrometer, the results were totally the opposite. For all the cultivars, the force required for cuticle rupture increased under salt stress conditions. And we can see that the cultivar that was the most susceptible was cultivar 4688, and the cultivar that was the less susceptible was cultivar this year 522. <coughs> the cultivar that had the higher resistance to the penetration of its peeled was cultivar 2206, and the cultivar that had the less resistance was the same cultivar that was the less susceptible cultivar, DCR 522. This makes sense with the dry peeled weight. In the dry peeled weight, all of the weights of the peels increase again under salinity stress, and the cultivar that was the less susceptible was cultivar 1335, and the cultivar that was more susceptible makes sense with also with the, with the penetrometer readings was cultivar 468. 46008. And the cultivar that had the, the heaviest peeled was the striped cultivar 2206, and the cultivar that had the, the less dry peel weight was cultivar this year 522. Then in the second phase, when we started destroying our sample, we wanted to get characteristics that would give us an idea of the juice and the taste. For this, what we did is we did, per, first of all, percent solids. We blended all of, to, all of our tomatoes. We weighed them in fresh and then in dry, and then all the rest of the blended material, we filtered it, and then we collected it in an SA tube. We took, took a liquid of it, and we put it into a refractometer. We did the same for the pH meter. We took the, the sample from here, we calibrated the pH meter, and we took the reading. The refractometer is telling us total soluble solids. For the organoleptic survey, we gathered 31 volunteers for the first harvest, 24 volunteers for the second harvest, and we asked them to grade the tomatoes according to poor, fair, or good for three components, for uh, skin thickness, for sweetness, and for general flavor. We ended up with 10 samples per volunteer because we had five cultivars, and we had both salinity levels of 1.5 and 4.0 decimals. Okay, the results that we acquired were for percent solids, pH, TCC, and, and the organoleptic surveys were as follows. For all the cultivars, when they are grown under salinity, the percent solids increase. And the cultivar that <coughs> tends to, to be more susceptible for the percent solids to increase is cultivar 1335, and the cultivar that is less susceptible is cultivar 2204. Ne but nevertheless, the cultivar that has the highest percent solids, again, is the striped cultivar, 2206, and the cultivar that has the less percent solids is cultivar 1335. And the pH and the TCC, we didn't see any effect, not in the interaction, and not on the salinity effect, and not on the cultivar effect, neither for the April harvest and the TCC, and neither for the main harvest and the, the pH. But we put the results, and you can see that the values were in the average of 4.2 for the pH and 6 for the TCC. For the organoleptic survey, what we saw is from the consumer's point of view, the cultivar for which it matters the most if you grow it in salinity or not salinity is going to be cultivar 1335. And the cultivar that matters the less where you grow it is going to be cultivar DCR 522 in terms of uh, skin thickness. The cultivar that had the lower skin thickness was cultivar 2204 and cultivar 2206. And the cultivar that, even though it didn't matter where you grow it, naturally already had a, a tougher skin was cultivar DCR522. In terms of sweetness, we saw that the cultivar <coughs> that doesn't matter where you grow it is cultivar 1335. And the cultivar that is the more susceptible is cultivar 2204. And in the, in the general flavor, what we saw is that the cultivar that is more susceptible is going to be cultivar 2204. And the cultivar that is going to be less susceptible for its general flavor, it's going to be cultivar 1335. But overall, the cultivar that the consumers prefer the most was cultivar DCR 522, even though it had the, the higher 
value of skin thickness. So we took our, our tomatoes and we wanted to analyze them in the microscope to see the structure of the cells in the composition. And we did two methodologies, light microscopy and Raman microspectroscopy. The first, <coughs> we wanted to see composition and morphology of the cells. So what we wanted to aim for with light microscopy is that we would take a section of the tomato cube and we were able to have cuticle and we would have a subepidermical layer here which is composed by smaller cells and the cells in the pedicarp. And I have to make it really clear that the peel is going to be confirmed by two components, by the cuticle and by the subepidermical layers here. And then the pericarp is something else. What we did is that we took a tomato cube around 0 0.5 centimeters cube and we put it into a solution of 4% paraform, paraform haldehyde in a PVC buffer, PVC is phosphate buffer at saline, and we vacuum for 30 minutes so the solution will get into the cells, and then we shake it for an hour, and then we put it for 4 degrees Celsius for 24 hours in the refrigerator. We came the day after, we wash off the PFA, we put a solution of 50% PEC for 22 hours, we wash it off, we put a, a, a solution of 100% PEC for 24 hours, and then we put it in the fridge so the pig will become solid. Once the pig, the pig became solid with our tomato cube, cube inside, it becomes something like this when we take it out of the, of the vessels. So with this instrument here, it's a microtone. We cut sections of 10 <coughs> micrometers and sections of 30 micrometers. The sections of 10 micrometers, we stain them with methyl in blue, all the sections for the same time of 10 minutes. We wash it off and we cover our slices. The, the sections of 30 micrometers, we took them to Raman microspectroscopy and we didn't stain them, we just washed the peg off and then we closed our slices. So what we did get with uh, light microscopy, we did get our sample with cuticle, with subepidermical layer and with pedicarp, but we also wanted to get montages that would allow us to evaluate differences between cultivar, this is one cultivar, another cultivar and the third cultivar. The cultivars that were evaluated went worth 1335, DCR522, and 46888, And we wanted to see salinity effect and non-salinity effect. <coughs> so once we had our montages, we, we fixed an area, and then with image J, we measure the cuticle area only, meaning the green part here, and the results that we got with light microscopy was as follows. Okay, so methyl in blue stains green for lipids. We can see here a cuticle. We have an external cuticle layer. Then we had an internal cuticle layer. We had the subepidermical layer here composed by smaller cells straight underneath the cuticle. We had an epidermical cell here and we had our pedicarp. And Lipids is green, meaning the cuticle, and cellulose in stains for blue. Higher concentration of cellulose will stain darker blue. In terms of the area, when we measured with image G, what well, we saw there were no differences. <coughs> Be the differences were really, were really insignificant as compared to the saline treatments. But let's remember that the peel is not just composed by the green part of the cuticle. It's also composed by the subepidermical layers. And in the subepidermical layers, we saw uh, tremendous differences. For example, if we grow the cultivars under non salt stress conditions, we will only have two layers of subepidermical. Here is one, and here is the second one. And if we go to salinity, we'll have one, two, three, up to four layers. And this was repeated in all the cultivars. This was for DCR522. We can see like there's a one and two subepidermical layers. And here we have one, two, three, maybe four subepidermical layers under salt and non-salt stress condition. It also repeated for the other cultivar. You have one, two layers here. When you have here one, two, three subepidermical layers, and then the pedicarp starts. So then we took our samples to Raman microspectroscopy, and we wanted to see the different composition based on the Raman shift peak. The Raman microspectroscopy is a technique that what it does is like we mm, not inject, we send uh, a laser energy to our sample and any component in nature has its 
molecules that have bonds. When the bonds uh, absorb the energy, they will be excited and they will go to a virtual energy stage and then they will return. But not all the molecules, not all the energy returns. Only 1% of it won't. And the Raman, what it does, it averages this 1% and it reflects peaks for different components in nature at a certain Raman shift value. So what the results that we got is that here was our example. We aim our laser. Oh, sorry, I forgot to explain this part here. This was our settings for the Raman. We had it to practice to see what were the best settings. Our Raman region for the components that we were evaluated was 1,200. The time of exposure that the laser <laughs> is open on our sample was 0 0.2 seconds. It was 10 times the laser was reflected in our samples at only 10% of the total potential uh, energy that the laser can emit. Mm -hmm. So in the cuticle, we had two major peaks. And then we go to the Daman, uh, Raman data um, database, and we saw that these two peaks are representing cutin. Then we went to the subepidermical layer, and we see that we got pectin here and cellulose here. And then we went to the, from here we went to the pericarp, and in the pericarp we saw only cellulose, no more pectin. And then it, we averaged them all without making the differences between 1.0 and 1.5 and 4.0 because we didn't see any differences <coughs> in intensity here. So we saw differences in composition in between the layers, but not in between the treatments for our discussion. So we ended up with objective tests, with sensory analysis, and with microstructural uh, analysis. In the objective test, we had smaller fruits grown under, if we grow the cultivars under salinity stress, but with higher percent solids. And we can explain this like as follows. Our differences were around 25%. The literature says that we shouldn't be getting these differences only if we will be working with the Siemens around eight and we were working with four. But it also says that the asylum intake, it's around, it reduces it in 25%. And the flowing fluxes into the fruit reduces in 90%, 9% daily. The fruit transpiration will increase around 30%. And all of this will bring us uh, less weight of 30% per organ, which is more close to what we, what we had. And then, if we are reducing the phloem under salt stress conditions, we are reducing the fruit size. And then if we're reducing the fruit size, we're going to increase the sugar concentration, and we're going to increase also the salt concentrations. Therefore, we are gonna end up with smaller fruits, but with higher percent solids, which was what um, the situation that we had at the end. Then, why did we have higher um, values of dry peel <coughs> weight, and why was it, was it tougher to penetrate the peel under soft stress conditions? There are studies done, but only on seeds, on tomato seeds, that under soft stress conditions, the test of the seeds accumulates cutin and trichome density. And if the cells accumulate cutin, they're going to become bigger, stronger, and heavier, so the force required to penetrate them will also be um, higher. In the microscopic, microscopic observations, although we did see the cutin, we saw the, the pectin, and we saw the cellulose, we think, I'll come back this, to this, that the main problem was this part here, that we hit three different points, and we didn't, we didn't actually like measure a gradient, and the Raman is capable of, of doing it. It can measure the whole thing, and, give us, and even give us a map, but because of matter of time, we didn't do this. So therefore, we didn't, we, were, we didn't get any differences in terms of composition. Okay, in the morphology that we saw with light microscopy is that we didn't see any differences in the cuticle area, but again, the peel is not just a cuticle, it's also the subepidermical layer. And in the subepidermical layer, I presented really few pictures before, so I wanted to repeat them here. The top pictures are non salt stress conditions. And the bottom pictures are salt stress conditions. And you can see that the intensity of the cellulose here, it's thinner than the intensity here. There are less layers all the time <coughs> under non-salt stress conditions. And we have more layers here with salts. 
So we do believe that there is a differences in, um, in, in not just in cellulose concentration underneath the, the cuticle, but the toughness is based here. Okay, so just to put it all together, we decided to start with which ones were the cultivars that the consumers liked the more. Okay, so they like more 1335 and this year 522. The problem is that these cultivars are the ones that are most affected or more susceptible for the, for the pure thickness. And even this year, it's the thicker, the one that has the thicker pure from the consumer's point of view. And this was reflected in the light microscopy because they have up to four and to five subepidermical layers when they are grown under salt stress conditions. And we will suggest that these two cultivars will be the ones that will be further studied to improve their salinity uh, susceptibility. Our conclusion will be that all the changes that in, induce it in tomato um, fruit texture under <laughs> salt stress were originating from thickening the peel, but not in the composition. And as conclusion, we will accept our hypothesis that high salinity conditions do induce undesirable changes in fruit and in fruit skin texture affecting its quality. And Thank you, and thank you all the persons from my lab because they were really patient with me. Yeah, I was willing to teach. Thank you. presentation <laughs> just um, because I'm thinking about now Zerai's presentation because he showed there that there are some genes that can have like for uh, can can have a good uh, oh okay can have a good um, trait and then uh, the same can have a bad trait so the, your conclusion like was consistent with all your results like uh, all the ones that are exposed to the salinity uh, they had a Undesirable changes. Undesirable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, re the, the thing you concluded that the salinity is stress, yes. it causes undesirable changes. Mm -hmm. Will the character be same in resistant and susceptible varieties or what? For or all, for all the, well, we saw that for all the varieties, I just point out the ones that were more susceptible and less susceptible, but for all the varieties, we had uh, undesirable changes in all of them, and all the effects were significant. Oh, it means the trend will be same, even if it is susceptible or resistant, it doesn't matter. Well, we don't, ha we, we don't have a background that we can say, okay, we think these cultivars are resistant. We just wanted to evaluate them. We, we, don't, we didn't know if they were actually resistant or not resistant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if you uh, observe the the yield of the tomatoes in the greenhouse. The what? Excuse the me? yield of the tomatoes in the greenhouse. The yield? The yield. Ah, no, we didn't observe the yield. They, in the Matnegev, they, they do have records of the whole yield plot in the computer, like I showed you in the beginning, right in the beginning. But we, we just took five clusters per sample. They, they have records of the whole thing. Oh, it's too bad. Here, you see, we had the whole plot, like let's say from here to here, and we collected all the markable clusters, and they, and we put it into the beans, and we did record the yield of the plot, but we didn't for for our studies we didn't use the whole yield plot. We only used the the average weight of 25 tomatoes from five clusters of the plot. Okay, my question is like I wanted to know how the yield. Uh, it looks like in the uh, high uh, salinity uh, conditions. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to find out. But since you said uh, you didn't do it, the, huh? well, the literature says that if you're working with eight decimals, you're going to start to have 30 percent decrease in yield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I have heard that uh, uh, tomato under salinity stress has more sweeter taste than the tomato under normal water mm -hmm. condition. 
do you know the reason why is it? And if you did you notice the difference in TSS content between the yeah with those? the with the organoleptic test we saw it was sweeter, and also with the percent solids we saw it was sweeter. The percent solids is the percent solids in the total um, TCC total soluble solids. It's an indicator. It's actually an indicator of sugars. So. It, 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 it increases because you have less water in the, in the fruit, so you have more concentration of the sugar and you have more concentration also of the, the whole percent solids. Mm -hmm. One question, if I get right or not, yeah. if we grow tomato on the normal irrigation and under the saline, then the peel thickness will be higher in the saline irrigation. Mm -hmm. Can we generalize it for the... Uh, other tomato varieties also? Can we generalize this? I, I didn't find any studies that were relate to the peel for the, the markable tomato, for the big tomato, but it's only, yeah. it's only seen in, in seeds that it does influence in the seed, but not, not on the peel, not exactly on the peel. There's, because all the studies are based on the, on the good things that salinity does for quality, but not on the, on the desirable changes. Okay. Other questions? Yes, here. Mm -hmm. Miriam, do you look on the local, the structure of the local might be? It Some people prefer in the texture to look on the structure of the locules and... This, sorry, I don't know, the structure of what? Locules. QTLs, you mean? Locals is the internal part of the... Uh, of, the uh, of the cell, you mean? Yeah. No, we, ju we just stain for, for the cell wall. With the, okay. the chemical that we use, methylene blue, it only stains for, for cell wall composition, in this case cellulose, and for the lipid composition, for the cuticle yeah. composition that was lipids, we, d we didn't stain for... So this thick sti skin, you consider it as, as bad, like a bad trait, rather than... Because some people may appreciate to have mm -hmm. a thick skin, which can, <coughs> which can, for example, yeah, for shelf life, even mm -hmm. when they are growing in high water content, they can be cracked within a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So it will have. That might be good, like you said, probably to have a thicker cuticle for for processed tomatoes, for big tomatoes, but for shade tomatoes, that's not a trait that you would like to have. And, and you can see it in the organoleptic survey results they, that consumers don't like to have a, a thicker peel. Yeah. You use for decimen per meter as mm -hmm. uh, stress, right? Yeah, What's on your water. base, I mean, mm -hmm. what was your base to use that one? That's what the research, uh, that's what the research had on said, 1.5 and 4.0. Okay. And I guess that through the time they were, they were um, think that the, because this value is for the water, that the yeah. with 4.0 you will be accumulating the salts in the soil afterwards. Okay, I mean, it, it, this one, the, irrig the concentration, the concentration of salinity in the irrigation water there in the Negev, or? Mm -hmm. that, that's the concentration of the salt they were irrigating with, 4.0. Normally the irrigation water had this one. No, I, I don't have, I don't okay. know the value of the, I mean the, the, the normal irrigation water in the, in the station, I, I don't know. Maybe if had you been using different uh, rates of salinity concentration, I mean, maybe. Yeah, it, it, it can be possible to, ev it would be good to evaluate different salinity levels rather than just 1.5 and 4.0. Mm -hmm. Until the, micro the microphone moves to the other <laughs> corner of the room, let me ask you something. Yeah. As I understand with the Raman, you, j you just identified qualitatively what is the major compound in each in each layer right yes but we could have also done it to qu to to quantify so it can be quantified yeah. however <coughs> in your conclusion you said that the uh, um, <coughs> that the composition did not change only the number of layers changed no i said that yeah the composition the in the layers, on the layers from 1.0 and right. 4.5 didn't change in, in each specific layer, only in between layers the 
we had, for example, cutin that we didn't have in the pericarp, and we had pectin that we didn't have in the in the cuticle. Okay, Omer, I didn't but understand between the question. one and the between the fa uh, the the, the 1.5 and the 4, mm -hmm. the, between the different salinity levels, you say that there was no. Uh, 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 let's say qualitative different in, in the in the major compound, but yet was there a difference in the, let's say, amount of, of uh, uh, pectin deposited or, or any other compound there? We saw there were no differences between 1.5 and 4.0, let's say, for cellulose. And then there were no differences in, okay, for the cuticle in 1.5 and 4.0, there were no differences for the cutin concentration. Understand? <laughs> and then for the subepidermical layer, for 1.5 and 4.0, we didn't see any differences in concentration for cellulose and for pectin. And then for pericarp, we didn't see any difference in concentration in cellulose for 1.5 and 4.0. What do you mean by concentration? I don't want to call it concentration because it's not an exact measure of concentration, but it's a measure of intensity. Like All right, but you did show uh, uh, some difference in intensity, at least in the cuticle, isn't it? No, it's different components for each one of them. Let me put, you see this one here? The blue one represents the, the cuticle, and it only has cutin. And then we have the second one that it's the subepidermical layer, the red one, and it has pectin, and it has <coughs> cellulose. And then the pericarp only has cellulose. What we saw we did have the spectrum. We did have different spectrums, for example, for, for cutin, for cuticle, for cutin, for 1.5, and we had a different spectrum for, for, the, for the same component in the cuticle, but we didn't see any difference in intensity, for example, here. We have two, maybe you're confused because we, we see two peaks here, but they're both representing bonds in the molecule of yeah, a cutin. I understand that, but th still, what? What are the differences between the, the, the treatments, I mean, in this respect? You say that you saw the same peaks, however, mm -hmm. peak represent, uh, you, the peak represents the quantity or only the, the quality? If Namely, the peak identifies what, what compound is there. If you decide that the peaks are similar, like let's say, I didn't even graph it, let's say for example the red and the green, Let's say that the, re the red will be 1.5 and that the green will be 4.0. And then you have this difference here, this delta here, in intensity. Mm -hmm. If you decide that the peak length is the same, you are sure that that peak is representing you cellulose, therefore you can compare the delta in terms of intensity for cellulose. Okay, so we so can what, say, okay, so, so what the did green you find out in this respect in comparison between the one and the... 1.5 and the, 4. We just difference. saw that yesterday. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's what we were discussing yesterday. That in the 1.5, we have a lot of fluorescence in the sample, so we're not sure that we're actually in the same sac bonds for cellulose, so that's why we didn't want it to make the assumption that there was differences between 1.5 mm -hmm. and 4.0. Okay, so you, are, you still don't have, you're not sure about it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to make any assumption because we're not sure, but we will see. Okay. <laughs> The salinity level, how the, the various salinity level you used affected the nutritional level, let's say vitamin C. That is, if you were looking at those components, the vitamin C, did you also look at how the, the various salinity level affected the nutritional components of the, we the did, fruits? We didn't measure any nutritional facts like level of antioxidants or stuff like that, but I, I will assume that it will increase the concentration of any for example, vitamin C or in any other component, it will increase the concentration because it has less water on the fruit. I'm believing. We have a few minutes for a last question. If there, <laughs> is, if there is any. Okay, if not, we will thank Miriam very much.